Say hi, Glenda. Hi. Smile. On July 4th, 1909, Daniel Burnham would unveil the plan of Chicago, the beginning of urban planning here. Basically, Burnham was taking us from an agrarian to an industrial society, and things were changing so fast in these days, you needed a plan to carry it out. The plan of Chicago. Burnham looked at Lake Michigan and the Chicago River surrounding prairies and mapped it out. He would see the river as the focal point of the city. In Daniel Burnham's own words from the plan of Chicago, 1909, not to get two Kim Burns on you, but grand and noble architecture should rise up along the river banks and be followed by grand and noble boulevards as well. Daniel Burnham, 1909. Those boulevards today are Wacker Drive and Michigan Avenue. We'll see those. We'll see how, how Chicago actually gained its title, the birthplace of the skyscraper in the late 1800s. Now that, my friends, was not really a plan. That was more of an accident. What we call the Great Conflagration. The real turning point in Chicago history, October 8th, 1871. That was the day that the great Chicago fire. On that day of fire, supposedly started me boils by days in now don't you know. Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over a kerosene lantern, starting a fire that took out 17,450 buildings in a day and a half. That because of that fire, architects, engineers flocked her to rebuild. You had a blank slate upon which to try new building technique. And you needed something new. After the fire, you weren't allowed to rebuild with wood in downtown Chicago. And depending on brick, masonry, meant that at your base, your wall would have to increase six inches every time you had a new floor, you didn't lose all your floor space to support. Sullivan describes it thusly, your building should be like a Greek column, a tripartite division of base, shaft, capital, or roof area, every inch of proud and soaring thing. The Chicago School goes on to influence the birthplace of modernism, the Bauhaus, which was a very famous art compound in 1920s Germany, long before it became a 1980s post-punk industrial band of the same name. Now the second director of the real Bauhaus, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, came to Chicago 1938 from the Illinois Institute of Technology here, which spread that modern look around the globe. Look to Lake Point Tower on your right, the tallest condo of 1968 in the world, first curvilinear skyscraper. Shipwright and Heinrich, architects, former students and employees of Mies. And that's modernism right there, where you find highly articulated structure, but no decoration. The modernist felt decoration was bourgeois, superfluous, dishonest. There he felt the building was honest and true when it expressed its materials. A word about Chicago's movable bridges, inspired by the bridges in Paris. This is called a trunnion bascule. Bascule is from the French for seesaw, and that's how this bridge works. It's got a counterweight. Move the counterweight, just like on a seesaw, and it can pop up in two minutes. Hey, we might see them going up today for the sailboats. That usually happens Wednesday and Saturday mornings. They open them uh, through the end of the month of June. New wave of architecture coming into Chicago yeah, right now from a young case. woman. Her name is Jeannie Gang, company studio gang. Look to your left, friends. Jeannie's first skyscraper garnering worldwide attention. It's the one with that shimmering glass and those crazy wavy balconies. It's called the Aqua Building. Looks like a it's wave in motion. Building. Form follows function, as Lewis Sullivan would say. The function of Genie's building here was to give every one of those floors a unique view of Chicago. So the form of the balconies were determined by working from the outside in. Genie and assistants would find the view like Millennium Park downtown. Then using models, they would point a laser back at the building. Now if the laser went in your window, that was cool. You had a sight line. If it hit the wall, still cool. Genie literally would build you an accessible balcony 50 stories up. In some places, they go 12 feet out so you could step out and have a view. And friends, here's a prime example of modernism. Look up the steps to Big John, the John Hancock Center, known as for its Trust Two exterior support system. 1,127 feet, 100 stories. Now, you just saw 46,000 tons of steel right there, not one ounce of decoration. That's that modern style where you celebrate structure. Postmodern Art Deco is NBC Tower to your right, Adrian Smith, architect uh, for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, harking back to the Art Deco of the 30s. I bet you know 30 Rock, the GE building in New York. You'll see that as you look at the front with the NBC Peacock, that was an inspiration. And coming up on our right, friends, the clock tower. London can have Big Ben, Paris, and Eiffel Tower. I'm a Chicago, and I'll take the clock tower of the one and only Wrigley Building. Commissioned indeed Wrigley by the building. chewing gum king, William Wrigley Jr., oh, who was a young Wrigley man building. had gone to Burnham's wonderful fair. He brought that Beaux Arts elegance right downtown. The clock tower of the Wrigley Building, modeled after the Spanish Renaissance, the 11th century Geraldo Tower in Sevilla, Spain. 
And to our right, it looks like a Gothic Cathedral Tribune Tower, home to the Chicago Tribune newspaper. 1922, Colonel McCormick of the Tribune offered $100,000 in a worldwide design contest for the most beautiful office building in the world. Howells and Hood of New York won out of 264 entries. Now everything was suggested from ancient Egyptian to Bauhaus, the modern style. Howells and Hood of New York were inspired by the Gothic cathedrals of France and Belgium, specifically the Butter Tower of the Roman Cathedral, the one that Joan of Arc is usually associated with. Speaking of France, we still call our Grand Boulevard Michigan Avenue Boule Miche, inspired by the Grand Boulevards of Paris. We have named the bridge the Sabo Bridge, however, for we honor the founder of Chicago, our first permanent resident, the French speaking fur trader from Haiti, Jean Baptiste Pantou Sabo, started a fur trading empire right there with the Tribune Tower since in 1779. From Adrian Smith of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, looming on the right with Spire is the new second tallest building in Chicago. For the life of me, I cannot remember its name. <laughs> oh wait, it's Trump International Hotel and Tower, New York financier and fading television star. The modernists who didn't like squares, hence the curvilinear design for Marina City Towers, which would earn their nickname in 1967. You see why we call these the corn cop towers. And right here, the student projects his teacher. Although Goldberg had studied with Mies van der Rohe, he found bots of psychological slums, a circle would bring people together. Fans of the Chicago band Wilco will recognize him from the CD cover of Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. You will notice Marina City to be a complete city. Everything is at your fingertips at home. Docking for boats. Are you hungry? You have four restaurants, a bowling alley, a swimming pool, a bank, office space, the House of Blues Musical Theater, and your living space upstairs. Goldberg did Marina City at the height of the mass migration when the middle class kept leaving the city for the suburbs. He was trying to help reverse that trend because without a strong middle class, you will never have a great city. And Bertrand Goldberg realized people would stay downtown if you could offer 24 hour urban living. The River Industrial, he gave you that option at the moment. The West. I keep a hotel like hell, yeah. Well, friends, it was at that Saga Nash Hotel. 13 electors gathered one day in 1843. The vote was 12 against one to incorporate. So on March 4th, 1837, Chicago, the place of the stinking onion, became Chicago, the city for every month. We're going to tour just a bit of the North Branch, and as you look around you, you see this industrial river with river barges still plying their trade, undergoing a residential renaissance. Now the project on our right is going to be not one, not two, but count them three residential buildings. Beginning with its 50-story rental unit here, this is called Wolf Point Tower, and then they'll add a 750-foot condo on the east and 950-foot condo on the tip. Hey, now here's a single-leaf bascule railroad bridge, so you can actually see how the seesaw works with that counterweight, yeah? Now this one's no longer in use, but indeed this was the Chicago Galena Union Railroad, 1848, first depot in Chicago. Used right up into the 90s, still carrying newsprint for the newspapers. Today, it's simply a piece of urban sculpture, scaring the people who live across the way at Fulton House, 1981, one of the very first loft conversion units in Chicago. Note the three foot thick masonry wall. This building was built in 1908 as a refrigerated warehouse for 70 years. Architect Harry Weiss had to defrost it for a whole year, just like your freezer, and they had to strip a ton of horse hair off the wall. Horse hair, wonderful insulation. Your horse will give it up. Harry Weiss, inspired by a single tree on the riverbank, did what I consider the four coolest townhomes in Chicago. These are called the River Cottages. Can you tell this architect was a sailor trying to get skylights like school sails or four windows? Harry Weiss would say, Water is a magnet, it will draw people to it. Harry got it. And we human beings have a Jungian art play. We all seem to long for the sea, the original source, the blue, the azure. And if you don't have the notion of growing my friends, sometimes a river is enough. I'll leave you with that thought. Respecting my neighbors at Kinsey Park means I'm going off mic for five minutes. This is a great time to visit Zap, your bartender. He indubitably, indeed, has a pleasing plethora. Today on Elston Avenue, Morton Salt, when it rains, it pours. Indeed, an air rights product. You know what happened, really? Chicago gave the railroads all this prime riverfront land. The deal, that would make us the railroad hub of America. You couldn't take a single train from New York to California back in the day. You had to change trains in Chicago. And surprise, if you got off a train in Chicago, your pocketbook, your wallet suddenly got lighter. You bought breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you got a hotel room. You left a little jack, a few dead presidents, a little money behind. Air rights means exactly what you think. You have the right. To buy the air from the railroad, you gotta stay out of the way. 
On the way back, you'll notice that they had a problem with this building. The far corner overhangs the switching yard, couldn't support the weight from the ground. They lifted it from the ceiling. There's a rolled steel truss up there. Some of you might yeah. see it right now. Yeah, That's yeah, called yeah. a cantilever. It's holding the weight of the building up. The train will then pass under, on our right, the first air rights project in Chicago, the Art Deco Chicago Daily News Building, first building to offer a public plaza as well. <laughs> hey, look to your left, the skyline drops off. You know, that's because the business district is really behind you now. I want to impress upon you that in Chicago, necessity was the mother of invention. You know one of the main reasons Chicago really became a skyscraper city? We had to. We were locked in. Your business district had borders, the river you're on was the northern border. The lake was east, south and west. You were caught up by railroad tracks. Now, if you were in business, you wanted to squeeze downtown where the action was, right? Well, think of it this way. Think way, especially my younger passengers. Think way back, before cell phones, before email, even before text messaging. Remember when business, business was the art of the handshake, the deal. You would meet your customer, not Facebook to Facebook, but face to face. In my day, we had two human beings in the same room. Yeah. OMG, imagine that, LOL sin. <laughs> we had no choice in Chicago. We couldn't sprawl out, so we sprawled up. A tip of the hat is due to Mr. Otis, too, don't you think? Without the Otis elevator, he'd still be on the first floor. By the way, Otis elevator has a regional office up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's only a one-story building. I find that incredibly sad. Have you guessed the architect of River City from 1986? I bet you can, because you know his work. Who liked concrete and reinforced steel, expressionistic like a sculptor? Bertrand Goldberg, who did the corn cob shaped Marina City Towers, yeah? Goldberg, the modernist, thinking outside the box. In his journal of the 1960s, when his teacher, Mies von Droh, and his peers were doing all those glass boxes, he would write, I am in rebellion against the century of static. I am in rebellion against the straight line. I refuse to remake humanity in the image of a machine. He said River City came to him by nature. It was inspired by a snake. It would have looked serpentine had all five buildings expanding 400 meters to the next bridge been completed. You know what? He always danced to a different drummer. I think there's a direct line of influence from Antonio Gaudi to yeah. Bertrand Goldberg. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking outside just the box. Gaudi. Oh, friends, real quick, can you get a squat? A picture of that squat building with an orange wall? See that tiny building in the distance? That's the Chicago Fire Academy over on the Colvin Street. That's where firemen get their training. That's the radio tower of the Fire Academy. Tallest building in America, 10th in the world today. I give you the one, the only, the Sears. Sears Tower. Thank you, but I have to be truthful. If Ayun from Tuva were here right now, he'd be shaking his head and going, no, Kevin, more strong. 1,451 feet, 1,727 if you count the antenna. Aha, we are not allowed to count the antenna on the roof because the Council on Tall Buildings and the Urban Habitat only recognizes spires. As the architect designs the spire, an antenna might be an add-on. Didn't need it, still the tallest building in the world for 22 years. Construction technique bundle tube system. Think of the building like a bundle of six wrapped together for strength. The building literally consists of nine, number nine, number nine, contiguous steel tubes, each is 65 foot square. Two will terminate at 50 floors, two at 66, three at 90. The final two, its entire distance, 110 stories. Now why did they terminate the different sections? Because you're in the Windy City. Although, did you know the nickname for Chicago Windy City had nothing to do with the wind? It referred to our early politicians changing their mind whichever way the wind blows and the fact that we Chicagoans are boosters of this city. Chicagoans are full of hot air, myself included. We never stop bragging. Tallest building in the world, 1974-1996, lost in the Tetranas Towers, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Shorter than floors in us, those twin office towers in uh, Kuala Lumpur. So what they do, the spire trip 25 feet. By the way, my Toronto group, you know, um, your uh, CN Tower in Toronto is in a separate category. They don't call it a building because of how it comes out of a post. They consider that uh, CN Tower in uh, Toronto as a structure. That's a whole nother, whole, whole nother level. And I think you probably know the tallest building in the world today, made it in the papers a lot. That would be the British Khalifa in Dubai, which stands 2,717 feet. It's not in Chicago. <laughs> do not fret, do not cry. Who is the architect of the Burj Khalifa Dubai? 
Chicago guy Adrian Smith did the NBC Tower and the Trump Hotel also did Burj Khalifa in New York. Now, let's talk a little bit about the postmodern movement because we have a great postmodern building coming up. Look all the way over to the right. You'll see a building with an old-fashioned roof of green gables, although to my knowledge, nobody named Anne ever lived in there. That's a modern office building by Philip Johnson and John Berkey, 1987. Now, Philip Johnson, very famous for his glass house, He's a dyed in the wool, old school, you know, uh, international style model. So you surround yourself with corporate towers and those tenants provide revenue. Everyone wants to know why does a typeface say Civic Opera a building with a V instead of a U up there? Well, if you use a certain early Latin alphabet, you don't have the letter U to choose from. With its surrounding towers, it does indeed look like a throne chair. So in 1928, people started calling this building Insel's Throne. For the man who commissioned the building, Samuel Insel, was indeed a king of electricity. He put everyone in the Midwest on the power grid. Now Insel's Throne is facing west, turning its back to the east. Now, some tour guides will claim to you that that's because of Sam's girlfriend. She was an opera singer, but she was just not that good. She was turned down by the New York Mets. Sam got mad, built an entire building in the shape of a chair, so he could turn his back on New York City and its opera and pout <laughs> in a grandiose manner. And you know what I'd call that? A whopper, a fish story, a tall tale. I would not believe one word of it. The problem is tour guides won't give it up. They've been telling that silly story for 50 years. Yes, our deco looks like a chair. There is a physical, mundane reason there. We will discuss it later. One block away, you name it the Haymarket Pub and Restaurant. You name all your brews after the historical figures of the day, both the policemen and the labor activists. You attempt to educate with each and every draft. So if you do go get a picture of the monument, you can go try the bratwurst and beer at the pub. Now, friends on the right, I know you're looking at the boats, but I do want to get in these three buildings as well. They're all by Colin Pedersen and Fox, who did the Pink Tower 311 South Wacker. I love this room because they're very contextual. You can see what they're reflecting around them. If you look at the 2004 building, it has an exposed square at the top. And from this angle, it's a ghost image of the clock tower of the Boeing building, a conscious uh, reference right there. Let's focus on this middle building. Can't get enough of 330 West Wacker Drive. Cone Pedersen Fox 1983. Now, this particular building is so striking. It was the cornerstone that revitalized Chicago's business district in the 1980s. And look how everything's about the river. The art mimics the building you take with a boat, the glass reflects architecture and skyline, nautical symbols in the lobby, housing, and the air conditioning. Now, here's another visual rhyme. And this one, you have to look at both sides of the river to get it. If you're taking photos, you'd have to get two pictures because first, I want you to notice the support columns. One on that end, two in the middle, and one here. Look close, they are octagonal in shape. Look closer, and they have strands of green marble uh, throughout the black, right? Just like the band. Now, to see the reference they were making, just like Doctor Who and the TARDIS, we'll go back in time to 1930, and look at the corner of the Merchandise Mart, right here above the bridge. Look at the corners, you have the same octagonal geometry. Can you see that? It's a conscious reference. Since you have that common design element, and since you can think of the buildings as having an architectural conversation in a somewhat Disney and anthropomorphic sense across the river there. As a concept, yeah. Any businesses under the right look. Finally, Mr. Hartford, who started the AMP grocery store chain. AMP, of course, that longtime famous grocer. Not to mention being the name of the short story set in an AMP. Which, by the way, is one of the best examples of a short story you can read and study, a &P by the writer John Updike. I do want to talk a little bit about the roadway that went in Wacker Drive. Vernon conceived it. Oh, by the way, the seating just went in uh, two week in, weeks ago. This is this ripple walk idea, what we're trying to do. And this is what we really want to see, people hanging out. The river walk was really fully realized right here. This beautiful little park on our right. Already been here about five years. It's our Illinois Vietnam War Veterans Memorial Wall. It is such a favorite of Chicagoans for a moment of fire and pose. And this is what we want to see people hanging out. Every time we see people sitting under these trees, it reminds me of my own open air university. My teacher was named Socrates. That was so long ago. Now, look in front of the Aon Center, two buildings of note with Spire and Chevron Roof from the mid-90s. That's two Prudential Plaza, postmodern Art Deco, obviously Chrysler building influence. Come forward, see the dark green Art Deco building with the 50-foot gold tap. Looks like a giant bottle of champagne, no? That's the Hard Rock Hotel. Now, the champagne design, many people will argue that was intentional. 
You see, the building dates back to Prohibition when you could not legally have a bottle of champagne. It was designed by the Burnham Brothers, Dan Jr. and Hugh, for the Union Carbide Company. What do you think? Many people think that champagne design may have been a little editorial comment on how they felt about Prohibition. Above my favorite Riverwalk Cafe, O'Brien's, the skinniest skyscraper in Chicago, 75 East Wacker Drive, only nine and a half of the cross that octagon crown. Now that building is clad with terracotta, as was the Hard Rock Hotel, as is the Jewelers Building and the Wrigley Building. Why do you think terracotta? Terracotta is so popular on buildings after the Great Chicago Fire. Well, obviously it looks great. You can color it, you can glaze it. Most important, terracotta being fired clay is fireproof. That was exactly it. You know, what people forget is that it's the merchants who bankroll a lot of these buildings. You hear about the architect, but there wasn't a merchant who was going to pay a penny until you, in, in, unless you insured him that his building was going to be as safe as possible. Letter word, it's going to be the father, E L I E L. If you need a four letter word, it will be the son architect, Arrow, E R O. And the thin man's dog is always Asta, and the Guthrie is never Woody, it's almost always Arlo. <laughs> Friends, NBC Tower on the left, you see it from this perspective. You know, I did, I did say in Art Deco it's like a um, reinterpretation of history. This is still a reinterpretation, but getting very close to imitation. Yeah. Oh, wow. Adrian Smith with the NBC Tower here, really, really. It really looks as close as you could possibly get to being an Art Deco building to me. And friends, I want to take another look at Big John, the John Hancock Center. I consider this the most Chicago of our skyscrapers. It was Bruce Graham and Dr. Fosler Khan before the Sears Tower. The first of our giants, 1969. I would urge you, please, stroll down Michigan Avenue and end up at the base of the John Hancock Center. It's beautiful, distinctive to tapering profile, not unlike an Egyptian obelisk or the Washington Monument. Go to the 94th floor and see the window jumping out at you. That is called Tilt. That opened last summer. To compete with the sky deck at the, on the Sears Tower, Tilt is a glass box with eight windows. You step in and you hold on for dear your life because they're going to tilt you 30 degrees in thin air. No one knows why, they just do it. Now, <laughs> if you'd rather just chillax, and I can actually say the word chillax now, it made it into the Oxford English Dictionary. If you want to relax, go up to the 95th floor restaurant and lounge. It is family friendly called the Signature Room, where the best view of the entire lakefront of Chicago is a floor to ceiling window located only inside the ladies' restroom. Ladies, you get the best view. This is no story. I've had that verified by 568 ladies on this very floor. And on our right, friends, we're passing Illinois Central, a huge air rights project. Mies van der started above the former Illinois Central Monday morning rail yards. Remember Harry Weiss and his charming river cottages. Look how Harry Weiss breaks up the orthodox boxes of his fellow modernists with a triangular Swiss hotel. A gentleman gets off the boat the other day and he says, tell me, did you, Mr. Harry Weiss, give the Swiss hotel that blue triangular design? Was he conscious that it would look like a giant Swiss Toblerone chocolate candy bar? No, no, no. I don't think the architect was thinking candy. Let's call that a bit of Jungian synchronicity. What do you think he was really doing? Architecture does not happen in a vacuum. Why would he use a triangle? He worked years before all the new condos of Lakeshore East were even dreamed up. So what he was really doing was finding the best way to get the most surface area of the building possible and orientation towards the lake front. It's kind of what you're after. On our left, friends, we're passing uh, City Front Center. It includes the Sheraton Hotel a little behind us. City Front Place rentals, where we wanted to from this beautiful fountain. This fountain is Centennial Fountain, designed by Mies van Gros Brands and architect Kirk Lohan, 1989, 100th anniversary of the group that traversed the river Chicago Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. At the top of the hour, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., that water cannon will shoot an 80-foot arc for five minutes across a 220-foot span of the river. Hey, and there's that Chicago flag again, with its two blue bars, its three white stripes, its four red stars. Yeah, you see, people always ask me that question, so I'd like to explain the flag. Let us now deconstruct the Chicago flag. The Chicago flag. Now there are two blue bars, there are three white stripes, there are four red stars. The top blue bar, Lake Michigan, Chicago River, North Branch, there you are. The bottom blue bar, South Branch of the River, Sanitary Ship Canal that travels far. Now the three white stripes, that's the sides of the city. There's a north side, south side, west side. We never think about the east side unless you go for a ride on the road right here. We call it Lake Shore Drive. The four red stars are the fort, the fire, the fair, and the fair. 1803 Fort Dearborn, Michigan Avenue, right back there. 1871 the great Chicago fire downtown everywhere. Now the third star is 1893. 
anyone been to Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry? If you're inside there, last building standing, the Columbian Exposition, World's Fair. And let's not forget the 1933 Century of Progress World's Fair, the Four Star. Ask an older gentleman who was there, what do you remember of Chicago 33? He'll say Sally Rand was the one for me. Sally Rand was the fan dancer. She showed up at the World's Fair wrapped in two swan feather fans, but she forgot her dress. But everybody said her dance made the fair worth attending. <laughs> Some were upset and took her to court. The Chicago judge threw the case off. I looked up his comments in the Chicago Tribune's 150 Days of Chicago History book they wrote for the sesquicentennial. You know what the judge wrote? Yes, well, a lot of people would probably like to put pants on horses. Case dismissed. Let the lady dance. <laughs> That's why Chicago was a city that Billy Sunday couldn't shut down. Friends, in, uh, let's come back to Lake Point Tower. Shipwright and Heinrich Architects, you know they were inspired by the glass skyscraper vision, just a sketch Mies had done back in Berlin back in the 1920s. The circle at the very top is a high-end French dining experience called Cité. I forced myself on your behalf to go up there after work one night and have a glass of wine or three with a service bartender so I could check out the 360 degree table settings of the menu. I go up there for dinner, the views are absolutely spectacular to monitor how much water can escape. Sure, it was a problem, but we fixed it because we're Chicagoans, that's what we do. And never was that Chicago attitude more evident, friends, than after that great Chicago fire, which mythopoetically speaking still determines our character today. Imagine the day after the fire, a third of the city is gone, 100,000 homeless. Now, it is said there were maybe 14 structures on the horizon in the burned out district, and yet the builders stood there looking for a sign of hope. The smoke clears, and like unto a dream, your visitor center, the water tower, would appear before them, and they thought, we will rebuild the city. And the unofficial model for Chicago since that very day has always been, I will. The builders did rebuilt Chicago with embers burning their feet, picked up the trash, geared it down here, threw it in the water, where it expanded the shoreline, Lake Point Tower standing on man-made shoreline, debris from the fire of 1871. The builders seemed to know that like the mythical phoenix, the city of Chicago would rise from its own ashes. That's the city surrounding us today, and we conclude our cruise. Thank you all for coming out. My name is Kevin Dubai. I'll be waiting for you all at the top of that ramp as you disembark to say goodbye and take questions over from your boarding photos. By captain's orders, please everyone must remain seated for the duration of the docking procedure, and we will end the tour with one final note. Chicago is an architectural gym, but it's also home to its musical style, the Chicago Blues. This is indeed Chicago Blues Fest weekend. So here's a little thing my own I call the Architecture Blues. She runs uphill. I said Chicago River. Well, the river runs uphill, wrong direction. Well, let's go to the city where the motto, the motto is I will.